Hey guys, um, I'm sorry to do this. There is going to be a part three for our segment on the colonial Americas, um, in particular dealing with the um, Spanish colony or New Spain. I forgot to add this work. It's kind of a weird work because they put it um, in, in the later Europe and American section content area, but it makes more sense to just put it, um, put it here in, in this PowerPoint. So it's just one work I'm going to talk about, so it's not going to be very long. Um, so this is a work by Miguel Cabrera. Um, it's a posthumous portrait, and that means after death, of um, Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. Um, she lived from 1648 to 1695, um, and she is... A, was a very esteemed Mexican nun and writer, and this is probably one of the most um, famous. <laughs> Sorry about that. Probably one of the most famous depictions of her. Um, she was considered the first feminist of the Americas. So when I talk about the Americas, I'm talking about the New World and the discovery of the New World. Um, so Juana lived as a nun um, of the Generi. Um, Geronimite, um, G J E R O N Y M I T E order. Obviously, this was named for Saint Jerome in the 17th century Mexico. And rather than marry, she chose to become a nun so she could pursue her intellectual interest. Um, she corresponded with scientists, theologians, um, other literary intellectuals in Mexico and abroad. Um, she wrote poetry and plays that became internationally famous and even engaged in theological debates. Um, she was born into a Creole family in um, 1648. Um, Sor Juana was a child prodigy at the age of 15. She amazed people at court by excelling at an oral exam that tested her knowledge of physics, um, philosophy, theology, and mathematics. Mathematics. She came to live as a lady-in-waiting in the house of the Viceroy, the substitute or representative for the Spanish king in um, Mexico. Shortly afterward, she chose to become a nun instead of Mary. Um, she entered the Carmelite convent in 1667, but left a year later to join um, the Geronimite order in 1669, and in the process gained intellectual freedom. The Geronimite order allowed her to host intellectual gatherings and, and live a very comfortable life. In the 1690s, she became involved in an ecclesiastical dispute between the bishops um, of Mexico City and Puebla. Um, she responded to the criticism she received as a woman writer, which culminated in one of her most famous works, um, The Answer, um, in 1691. Um, this work defended her right as a woman to write, a, to write and to be a scholar. At, um, at one, she claimed that I do not study in order to write, no, nor far less in order to teach, which would be boundless arrogance in me, but simply to see whether my study, to see whether by studying I may become less ignorant. Um, this is my answer, and these are my feelings. So this was a quote by her. Despite her eloquent defense, the church forced her to relinquish her literary pursuits and even her library, where she sold her library and musical and scientific instruments. She wrote a document that renounced um, her learning, which ended with, I, Sor Juana, Inez de la Cruz, the worst in the world. Oh. Um, and she signed it in her own blood. After giving up her intellectual pursuits, um, she cared for the infirmed, um, during an epidemic, um, but she fell sick herself and passed away. She was, she was an incredible sort of feminist figure. Um, and, you know, she was a nun, and, and that is something I think that a lot of um, women chose to do instead of marry, um, you know, so that they might be able to, to pursue sort of intellectual pursuits. Um, so let's talk about how Miguel um, Cabrera um, painted her and what, you know, his depiction of her might suggest about her and her personality and who she was. Um, so he positions um, Sor Juana in such a way that the portrait insists on her status as an intellectual. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that indicate this. Definitely she's seated at a desk. 
there's definitely a library and lots of books behind her. So I think um, this was a very important element um, in terms of um, the setting um, in which she was depicted. Um, Kabir never actually met Sorwana, so he likely based his image on earlier portraits of her, possibly even some self-portraits that she might have painted herself. Um, Kabir likely modeled this painting on images of male scholars seated at their desks. So you can see this is one example here by Antonio de Fabrino. Oops. Um, this is a picture of St. Jerome in his study, and I think definitely you can see um, the inspiration that he might have gotten from similar portraits of, like this. Um, again, he possibly found inspiration in depictions of St. Jerome, the patron saint of Sorwana's religious order. Images often portray St. Jerome seated at a desk with a study surrounded by books and instruments of learning, which is exactly what um, Cabrera has done in his depiction of Sorwana. Also, in many ways, this is, a, you know, a typical nun portrait of the 18th century Mexico. Um, you know, she is depicted wearing the habit of her religious order. Um, she also wears um, what's called a nun's, a nun's badge right here. In Spanish, it's called Escudo de Monja. It's spelled E-S-Q-U-D-O. And then D E and then M O N G A, which translate as a nun's badge on her chest underneath her chin. It's kind of large. Um, and these were often painted. Um, sometimes they were occasionally woven. And they usually displayed the Virgin Mary, um, as you can see here. And this is an example of one, um, a real one, um, that a nun would have worn. And look at that beautiful tortoise shell frame that it's in. Um, the depiction um, that Sorwana, her um, nun's badge shows um, the Annunciation scene. And this is the moment in which the Archangel Gabriel informs Mary that she will bear the Son of God. Um, her left hand, and I'll go back, toys with a rosary, you can see here. And while she turns the page, of an open book with her right hand. This book is a text by St. Jerome, the saint after whom her religious order was named. Cabrera's portrait also differs from other nor, um, nun portraits in several important ways. Um, you know, she's looking towards us. Her gaze is very direct and assertive as she sits at the desk, so she's very confident. She's surrounded by her library and instruments of learning. Um, the library here includes books on philosophy, natural science, theology, mythology, and history, and so it reflects the types of work um, in Sir Juana's own library. Writing implements rest on the table, a clear allusion to her written works and intellectual pursuits. The rosary, a sign of her religious life, is juxtaposed with items signifying her intellectual life, so there's this sort of infusion with the intellectual and um, um, her spiritual um, beliefs. The books, the desk, the quills, and inkwell aid in conveying her intellectual status. The red curtain, common in elite portraits of this period, also confers upon her high status. So this is finally the last work in our segment on the colonial Americas, um, New Spain, or some, some art historians refer to it as a transatlantic um, sort of connections um, where we have this sort of colonization of the new world. But in, in this particular one, we are going to be, we were looking at um, Spanish colonization. So I have also attached, or I'm going to give you in class, um, the, the PowerPoint note packet and just um, staple this to the back of your Colonial Americas one and it should be complete.